Jaime Jorge, one of two children born to a brave pastor and his wife in Cuba. And I am thrilled that we can unpack some of his adventure. Jaime, come right in here. What a thrill to have you Thank with you. us. Thank you. We don't count as one of the 225 uh, stops this year. No, not enough songs. Oh, I'm glad you made it here. I, we're going to resort to some of the pictures in your book, No More Broken Strings. Look at that sweet cherub at the top. Your mom and dad called you Osito? Little bear. Little bear. And, and what a brave uh, little bear. I, I love the story of you selling your toys to, to keep your dad's church open. How old were you when you made that uh, choice? Six. Six years old. And you were only allowed three toys a year? That's what uh, the law said. That's what you could acquire through the normal means. Some people were able to finagle, you know, something else here and there by way of food or clothes. But that's what you were allowed. And uh, most of our young people were very faithful to the Lord, not nominally, but completely. Most of our believers in Cuba have been that way because their faith has been tested. It was an eye-opener to read about the persecution, the fear mm -hmm. uh, that you lived with. And I want so much for you to tell the story of uh, how old were you when those boys threatened to cut you up into pieces? Yeah, it was about uh, seven, eight years old. And I lived in a uh, pretty nice neighborhood. The houses were all uh, together. So this home's uh, wall was the beginning of the next home's wall. Kind of a row, mm -hmm. row houses. And so we would all come out and uh, see each other and there were two or three other Christian young kids in the, in the neighborhood in the block mm. and we would uh, go to the ball field to play and oftentimes they would say, we don't play with Christians, so we would be relegated to just watching. But you know, we had a wonderful life because our parents and our families for the other children that had believing parents, we were loved and we were shielded and, and we loved Jesus. So mm -hmm. some of the things that we saw outside were compensated by the wonderful love that we received from our parents and community. we were taught about Jesus. So, but uh, I went, you know, on this particular day, they needed one more person to play baseball and have two teams and they allowed me to play and I was very excited. Uh, I wasn't very uh, good because I hadn't played very often so when I would hit the ball I would run to first base with a bat and the kids would have a good laugh at that but I had a great game, I had a wonderful time. When it was all over they made a circle around me and the bully came to the middle of the circle and said, you believe in God, don't you? And I said, yeah. He said, I have read in the Bible that God raises people from the dead. I said, yes. He said, well, we don't believe that that's possible. We don't believe in God. So we're going to find out if there is a God today. And I was like, okay. And he says, um, we're going to kill you. We're going to find out if God will resurrect you. We're going to kill you and we're going to cut you up into little pieces. And we're going to throw those pieces all over the place and we'll see if when we get done with you, God can put you back together. Now I had seen these young people grab a cat, tie the tail, hang it, and throw rocks at it, you know, until the cat died, and other things like that in the neighborhood. So I thought these kids were serious. I thought I was gonna die. I didn't have time to go home, to write a will, to say goodbye. I just had time to pray and say, Jesus, help me. And when I prayed that short prayer, all of a sudden a peace came over me, and when I opened my eyes, I said to the bully, Alexis, you guys can do whatever you want, because God is powerful enough that he can raise me back from the dead. But if he doesn't, that's okay, because I'm gonna go to heaven. <laughs> and that stopped them from continuing to threaten me or harass me. It almost made it as if they reacted em embarrassed at what they had said, that they would kill somebody. They just went away. Completely, and, and they allowed me to go home. And here's the interesting thing. As long as I lived in that neighborhood, we moved not long after that, they would come and knock on the door and ask my mother, Mrs. George, Mrs. Jorge, could Jamie come and play with us? Because the Bible says that if we are willing to give anything up, even our lives, we will be rewarded in a far greater measure. And so it served to actually create respect mm -hmm. with them. And they came seeking for me now so that I could play with them any time that I finished playing my violin. 
practicing. Just stunning courage and faith in Praise the Lord. a little guy. Now you do say you wish you had held that that bold, tenacious faith through all the chapters of your life. Certainly. So we, we just have a few minutes to tell an amazing story. Mm -hmm. I want to mention at age six, you had rheumatic fever. Your heart was so damaged, your parents were told you wouldn't live past your teens. That's right, and, and I don't wow. know much about that because again, they hid and shielded all of that from me, but they took me to the beach for three months. And the Lord worked the miracle, but it also talks about the power of of natural healing and, and, and nature's healing. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of being there for uh, quite a bit of time, uh, the Lord did work a miracle and, and uh, my health was restored. Tremendous family. Uh, you were given a violin at four, started lessons at five, twice a week on a bus. Mm -hmm. uh, the sacrifices made, your mother making plastic flowers. And then there was another adventure with pigs to, to help her get piano lessons. A hard, hard working family. And I think the boldness, I, I just got to read this. Your dad was looking for an exit visa for 20 years trying to get out of Cuba. Mm -hmm. And he actually wrote a personal letter to Fidel Castro. And I'm just gonna read it quickly. This is to Castro. I am a Christian minister, Mr. Castro. I have been trying to leave Cuba for the last 20 years because we were not allowed to pursue our religious beliefs here. My family and I are a nuisance and a bother to you. And we go through a great deal of pain and suffering for our faith. I am no good to you. I am not an asset to you. And I would like to ask you if you would be kind enough to allow me and my family to leave this country so that we can practice our faith and our belief in God and worship him freely. That was a, a, a jail <gasps> sentence, you Whoa. know. Uh, people would, would be taken away uh, and maybe even killed for less than that because in Cuba, everything was supposed to be peachy, fine, great, you know. Now I want to say that by the grace of God the doors have opened up in the last few years mm -hmm. and there's a lot more opportunity for people to worship God and the gospel to be preached without any uh, repression or persecution. So I'm very thrilled you know, and thankful to the Lord. But this is how it was for many years uh, during the first three, four decades of, of communism in Cuba. Now I mentioned the big opportunity that was I'm sure a crisis of your faith uh, you weren't wearing the red scarf right? and you weren't willing to renounce your faith and it meant, well, the people who were, were working with you said, you know, your career was over. Your, your gift as a violinist was uh, not going to amount to anything. Moscow was out. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thankful to the Lord that that happened at the age of nine or ten because it, had it happened ten, twenty years later, living in a country like the United States, in a country like Canada where we have so many freedoms and opportunities, I don't know if I would have reacted with that same resolve mm. and dependence upon the Lord because it didn't take me long to say thank you but no thank you. If, if I have to give up my faith in God to become a great violinist or to go to Moscow, then I am not interested. So my parents had taught me, as it says in, in uh, Acts 5.29, that it is better to obey God rather than men. And so when that opportunity came, it was a no-brainer to me uh, because I knew that the talent I had had been given to me by God and that's how I was going to use it. Not for somebody else's glory, not for my own gain, but for God's honor and glory. And, and if that wasn't a part of it, then I didn't want anything to do with it. And we see God's faithfulness in providing in Cuba and Later, I mean, there was a wonderful teacher waiting for you when you finally got to come yes. to America. Uh, let me see the date. You know it very well. December the 3rd, 3rd 1980. 1980. Uh, it, was about, it was Christmas time. Red Christmas. Yes. Red Christmas. And uh, uh, very cold. <laughs> the coldest winter in Wisconsin in 80 years. 69 it, inches of snow. Oh, no. Um, the house where we were living in didn't have any heating. So it was a rough start, but the Lord blessed us, people from the community. That's what uh, made me aware of the, the, the graciousness and the generosity of the people of North America. Mm -hmm. Very giving, willing to share uh, at any time. And they would come to our doorstep and leave blankets and food and clothing. And that's how my family got started. You didn't even know the notes no. for their names in music. That's right. You knew them as Do, Re, Mi, right? <laughs> and um, I, I just love that one of your first thrills, something you had always dreamed of doing, 
chewing gum. Absolutely. Not allowed in class, though. No, no, no. <laughs> in fact, for many years in college, I would spit my gum out when I would walk in because that's what I was told. You can't chew gum in, 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 in class. But chewing gum was like a luxury for me, a beautiful thing. It was mm. cool to just be smacking your lips and you're, <laughs> you know, going like that. So it was a beautiful thing. It's not going to be easy to see uh, just one other huge test of your faith. Maybe one of the biggest ones, linear, linear scleroderma. Yes. Am I saying it correctly? Can you see a, a, a ridge down here and on, and really you can see some of the maybe in the shading here. Mm -hmm. This was a disease that was eating through bone and muscle? That's right. It is an autoimmune disease. Um, when I began to see the work that it was doing, eating away at my face, I was angry and I blamed God and, and I was frustrated. I remember looking in the mirror and saying, why are you doing this to me, God? Well, obviously I was wrong. God doesn't cause bad things to happen to his children. Uh, I had this autoimmune disease, no way of knowing how or why I got it. But as I found out later, I was very fortunate because 90% of the people who have scleroderma, uh, it manifests itself in a systemic form attacking joints, muscles, and organs of your body. Uh, and it's still a disease where there's not a lot of hope or help. Uh, much less in 1990 when I was diagnosed with it. So they didn't know if this was systemic or, or it wound up just being localized. So even though it did some damage, it didn't go anywhere else. Imagine if it would have spread to my fingers. I would have lost the opportunity to be able to play the violin. The so, irony is... Praise God. And there's so much more to this story. But, but two things wrestling through the whole journey because you were on a path in university to become a medical mm -hmm. missionary, to become a doctor. And, and God wrestled you back to the thing you seemingly kept running from. That's right. The violin. <laughs> and, and, and the other part was the mischievous part of you. The little, little rebel who became a little petty thief too. <laughs> but God just won you back through many things. And it's a wonderful story. Where is this book available? Through our website, www.jaimejorge.com. Oh, keep the Jaime Jorge. Okay. Don't let them change it. <laughs> um, and, and beautiful music. I, I don't know if you're playing the violin that you say you treat like a member of the yes, royal family. Yes, most definitely. Is this the, the $20,000 violin? We're going to hear Which it. Which is again. a cheap violin, you know, compared to Stradivarius's and Guarnerius that, uh, that cost three, four, five million dollars. But, you know, that's a lot of money for me. It makes a wonderful sound. Praise Don't the Lord. put your knee through this one like Amen. you did one of the previous. <laughs> Jaime Jorge, what a privilege to have you. When you're Thank coming you. through, please come again.